calm down, son. It's just a drawing. 1988. Who Framed Roger Rabbit's Hit Cinemas? A film which is set in a universe where cartoons and real world people live alongside one another. The film's plot revolves around a private detective who's trying to clear the name of a toon called Roger Rabbit, who's been accused of murder. The film was a landmark for live action animated crossovers, as although it wasn't the first time such a thing had been done, it was the first time it had been done well. Dynamic shading and lighting gave 2D characters a more 3D appearance, and various animatronic techniques made it feel like the characters were actually there, existing alongside the actors on camera. Despite the large presence of childhood cartoon characters, the film actually had a pretty mature tone to it, with a lot of adult jokes that flew over my head as a kid. But tell me, Eddie, is that a rabbit in your pocket or you're just happy to see me? And other adult themes that weren't quite as subtle, some of which were, uh, thrown into your face. Because of this, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a hit with both younger and older audiences, and with its impressive box office revenue, it is arguably responsible for introducing the silver wave of animation, as large companies started realising that animation could have an audience beyond cheap children's television. It's free real estate. And naturally, when you have a successful product, there are normally other companies who are keen to imitate that product normally a much lower quality than the original. It's just up ahead. 1992, and a new film is released. One which also features a live action detective working alongside cartoon characters, only with a much more... adult focus. This film was Cool World, which tells the story of a cartoonist who finds himself in the animated world he thinks he's created where he is seduced by one of his drawings named Holly, who wants to do the dirty with him. The film was directed by Ralph Bashke, who was a strong believer that animations can be just as marketable for adults as they are for children. And looking at his previous works, yeah, you can see that. When I looked up the trailer for Cool World on YouTube, one of the comments below described it as, Roger Rabbit's mentally retarded, chlamydia ridden cousin. And yeah, that's actually a pretty accurate description. So with that all said, let's take a look at the interesting film, Cool World. The film opens up with what is actually a pretty catchy theme. Kind of reminds me of the classic soundtracks you would get on the old Sega Mega Drive games. And from that 90s techno, we appropriately open up in 1945, Las Vegas, where we're introduced to Frank Harris, played by Brad Pitt, who has just returned back from the Second World War. And no, don't worry about paying too much attention to this, as it will have nothing to do with the rest of the film. Frank shows his mum a bike that he won in a poker game, and the two go out to take it for a spin, which I think she may be enjoying a little bit too much. Unfortunately, however, the two crash into a couple who are out drink driving. How did Frank not see this car coming? Sure, it came at an off angle, but the landscape is so open and plain, it would be hard not to see the only other moving object come plowing towards you. Then again, maybe he was just a bit distracted. Mother. This causes Frank to have a PTSD moment which again, don't worry, this will never come up again in the film, and he discovers that his mum has been killed. In what I guess is meant to be a sad moment, but honestly, it comes across as unintentionally funny. Suddenly, we get this abrupt cut, and Frank is teleported into the cartoon world. What the fuck was that editing? Turns out a cartoon scientist was trying to teleport himself into the real world, but instead ended up teleporting Frank into their world. You're cartoons. You're not real. Well, judging at how seamlessly you're interacting with Frank there, not even being able to crease up his suit, yep, 
I'm convinced you're real. We then jump forward to 1992, for some reason. And you know it's now the 90s as the music has been cranked up to the extreme. We get introduced to a prisoner cartoonist, John Crickfalusi, I mean Jack Deebs, who is busy drawing his next wank for the evening. It's time you came to me, Jack. Oh, don't you worry, he will. The drawing, named Holly, suddenly comes to life and transports Jack into the cartoon world, known as Cool World, a world which he had been drawing. How did Holly manage to bring Jack into the Cool World? I mean, the scientist guy we saw earlier only managed to do so because of his magical spike, but here, it's never explained. Jack lands into a club full of Tex Avery inspired wolves, and wait, what was that? Did the animation just materialise whilst it was still in frame? Uh, don't think about it, here's a hot woman dancing. Jack begins to heavily simp for Holly, but before he can touch her, he is teleported back to his prison cell. Jesus Christ man, clean that toilet of yours. We then once again see Frank, who hasn't aged a day despite nearly 50 years passing, but that's not nearly as impressive as his car, which can transform from animated, to real life, and to cardboard. And yep, you've guessed it, none of these are ever explained in the rest of the film. Turns out Frank is now a detective in Cool World, who is investigating Jack's mysterious appearance in Holly's Club, where we get some more convincing interaction between him and the animated characters. Turns out Holly wants to get into the real world and plans to use Jack to help her. Why are we getting these random characters running across the screen? They don't seem to serve any purpose? They abruptly cut? And the film even plays the same animation twice. What? Don't think about it. Apparently there is a reason to these random animated characters popping up on screen. See, the animators for the film were never given a screenplay for it, and were just instructed by Basky to quote unquote, do a scene that's funny, whatever you want to do. And as a result, you get these random cartoon gags just thrown in. I took inspiration from this and thought it could be fun to put out a request on my YouTube and Twitter to see what you guys could come up with, given the same set of instructions that Bashki gave to his team. And to my surprise, a lot of you responded, so thank you very much for that. Sadly I can't show them all, but you will see a select few throughout this video. We cut back to Jack who's now been released from prison and is checking out a local comic book store run by your typical good looking comic book store girl. Turns out Jack's comics are actually pretty popular, but there's also some other fame tied to Jack as well. Why don't you do a book on that guy you murdered? You know, that guy you found in bed with your wife? Well that's some pretty big exposition isn't it? I wonder how our comic book store girl will react to that. So uh, do I am? It's oh. <laughs> oh who cares you're hot. Jack is once again teleported back to Cool World, somehow, and is taken away by Holly and her goons to a club. Frank, however, is already there waiting for them. What'd you do with this, dudes? Around here, this can be a big nuisance. <laughs> and now I will proceed to return this godlike device back to your possession. He also warns Jack about the number one rule in Cool World. Noids do not have sex with doodles. It's the oldest law in Cool World. I've never had to enforce it. Why is that the oldest rule in Cool World? Until the arrival of Frank in 1945, we're assuming no other humans, or noids as they're referred to, have arrived in Cool World. So why was this a pre-established rule? Who even made that rule? Was it the science guy? And does that mean you can still go second and third base? These are the important questions people. Turns out Holly wants to break this rule and has tried having sex with a bunch of other humans in the past, with Jack being her latest attempt. Which again raises the question as to how she's teleporting them 
And also, if this is meant to be the world that Jack has drawn, how has it existed way back in 1945? Think about it. Jack has then returned back to the real world, from his ceiling for some reason, and after a 5 second scene in the desert, is transported back to Cool World. Frank and his detective partner Nails are suspicious of this so try to break into Holly's club to try and find Jack. It is not a cold horse. I am allergic to clouds. What? You'd think that would have been valuable information before you scaled a sky high building. Also, it makes me question what would be the consequences for Frank if he did fall. I mean, being in this world prevents him from aging, so does it also prevent him from dying? In Roger Rabbit, it's shown that cartoon physics can apply to humans in the cartoon world, but here, it's never really explained. Frank questions Holly as to where Jack is, but Holly says that she hasn't seen him, so Frank… just leaves. Great detective work there. Jack then arrives at the club, where he finally does the dirty with Holly, in what is an incredibly weird and uncomforting scene to watch. <laughs> like, he's not even moving in this shot. This leads to a literal explosion, which causes Holly to turn into a real person played by Kim Bassinger. Which, fun fact, behind the scenes Kim wanted this film to be toned down enough so that she could show it to the sick children in the hospital. Like, no offence Kim, but when you read the script to this film, what part of any of this did you think could be potentially shown to sick children in a hospital? Frank then heads back where he has some more convincing interaction with his cartoon girlfriend. Why don't you put that arm around me? It's been kind of a tough day. Oh. Yeah, good idea. Cut away so you don't have to animate any more awkward interactions. And you know, on this note, let's just compare these live action interactions to Roger Rabbit. See, in Roger Rabbit, the interactions were far more convincing. After the characters were animated, the footage was then sent off for compositing where technicians animated dynamic shadows, lighting, and tone mats separately to make the cartoon characters look more three-dimensional and give the illusion that the characters were being affected by the lighting on the set. That and they had some great animatronics to make it look like the tombs were really interacting with the real world. Here in Cool World though, there aren't many dynamic shadow or lighting effects and the objects the tombs interact with don't always react to them making them look completely separate from the world they're supposed to be in. Apparently the studio claimed the film to be a technical achievement of the live action and animation genre, but no, Roger Rabbit definitely did this much better, Christ I'd even say that the 1940s Looney Tunes short did a more convincing job. Back to the plot. Nails receives a tip off that Holly managed to do the dirty with Jack. Despite Frank telling him this earlier on, Since you call me, you call me here, or Lonette's, my place, I don't know. You just don't make a move without me, you got it? And despite the fact that this very act could destroy the world, She might damage the entire interworld matrix or something! Nails decides not to tell Frank about what's just happened, so that he can continue to experience his trouser scraping boner. Nails arrives on the scene to try and stop Holly. You eight -arm ink spot. Actually, it seems that he only has six, and technically only four of those seem to be arms. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Holly manages to suck Nails up through Jack's fountain pen. Yeah, good thing you gave that back to him, Frank. So Holly and Jack teleport back to the real world. Somehow. And for some reason, despite teleporting together, end up appearing in different locations. And this time it also seems to have caused a large cloud of smoke to form, which causes two of his neighbours to come over and investigate. This is me. <laughs> I'm real. Yeah, you sure are, honey. <laughs> yep, just that convicted murderer Jack hanging out with some clearly drugged up woman. Nothing more to see here. Jack and Holly head down to a local bar in which Holly has a super awkward dance scene with Frank Sinatra Jr. 
Yeah, the actual Frank Sinatra Jr. She's in my pants. Hey, she's with me. No, she's with us. What kind of rapey bar is this? Where if you turn up with your girlfriend, the bar takes possession of her and throws you out? It's free real estate. Things start to get weird, however, as Holly and Jack begin turning into doodles. Why they turn into these random figures, as opposed to animated versions of themselves, is never explained. And no one in the bar seems to care, so why should I? Frank finds out about Holly and Jack, and decides he needs to get back into the real world. In what again I think is meant to be an emotionally tense scene, but turns out to be absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Holly says that they need to find the spike of power to fix themselves. Oh yeah, remember that spike that was briefly mentioned near the start of the film? Well now it's a plot device. She kicks Jack out of the car, and speeds off to get the spike at the top of the casino. Frank eventually teleports to Jack's place. Why it took him so long, why he's covered in blood, and how he knew to teleport to Jack's place, we will never know. Oh, think about it. Jack tells him about the situation, and so the two, and Jack's neighbour, who's there too I guess, head to the casino to stop Holly and take her back to Cool World. Cool World's real? Neat. I am totally cool with everything that's happening. We cut back to Holly where we get some hilarious comedy. She's unable to get into the casino, but is then confronted by a midget in a trench coat, who turns out to be the scientist we saw at the start of the film, even though we can clearly see the human under this disguise. The scientist tells her that the spike is too much power for her to handle, but seriously what is the actual power of this spike? Apparently it's to enable the teleporting between worlds, yet everyone has been doing that in this movie without it. Holly tries to erase the scientist, but the gang turn up to stop her. Jesus Christ, they weren't even trying at this point. Frank chases after Holly, who can apparently walk through solid objects when in doodle form, but Holly ends up pushing Frank from the building, and he ends up falling to his death. Boy, it's just too bad those strings can have saved him. Now, this is where things get really weird. Like, even weirder than they already have been. So, just check this out. Jack, this is your chance to make it right. It's up to you now. I want to do something right. He's fulfilling his destiny. He's becoming a hero. What? Ignoring the bullshit stretch arm powers which has come out of nowhere, since when has Jack been destined to become a hero? All he's been so far is some crazed simp, creepy race face convicted murderer. Yeah, remember that? This guy is a murderer. And now he's the hero of the film. Oh, think about it. Holly manages to reach the spike and releases it which causes the cartoon world to enter the real world. I mean, pretty bad place to put a spike on a building like that. What if the building is ever damaged or knocked down? Surely it would have been better in some underground cave or something. Anakin, my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy! If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. This also apparently causes Jack to turn into a superhero. <laughs> what? So he's gone from convicted murderer, to metaphorical hero, to an actual superhero. The thing is, he doesn't even act anything like Jack anymore, and he isn't even voiced by the same guy. Holly is, uh, she's from out of town. The spike, it's up to me to return the spike. Also, if he's meant to now be a literal superhero, why is he getting such enjoyment out of murdering these bad guys? Like, he's really enjoying it. Getting a lot of Homelander vibes right here. Holly then turns up and asks Jack to return the spike to her, to which he... does? What? Okay, so this is the woman that manipulated you, 
happily ditched you when you got to the real world, stole your car, and murdered her detective. And you were willing to just give her the spike back like that? Simp. Hey, goody, goody, goody. Aha! A trick! Yeah, no shit it was going to be a trap, you wet sock. Jack manages to return the spike, and everything gets returned back to normal. During the commotion, Holly's pen is dropped from the building, which causes Nails to be released. He finds Frank's body, and requests to have it taken back to Cool World. Which again, they manage to do incredibly easy, without the aid of this magical spike. Yep, my reaction exactly. Frank's girlfriend finds Frank's dead body, even though you can clearly see his eyes are twitching, and then this happens. Nails, was she a doodle when she aced him? Yeah, so was. When they get killed by a doodle, they become a doodle themselves. What? When was that ever established at any point in the film? And why did it take this long for the effect to take place? Just so it could happen at the perfect time? This is like season 5 Samurai Jack levels of bullshit. So Frank is now alive in doodle form, which means he can have sex with his doodle girlfriend. Oh, you're a hero, Harris. You saved the world. I mean, he didn't, Jack did, but whatever. And it looks like Jack and Holly are now living together. Sure, fuck it, why not? A happy ending all round, and the credits roll. Good lord, what a clusterfuck of a film. The plot of the film really feels all over the place. We have Frank's backstory which never amounts to anything, Jack who suddenly becomes the hero character, and lots and lots of unanswered questions. The answer is don't think about it. I mentioned earlier how there was drama behind the scenes, and much of that had to do with the film's story. Originally the film was set to be a horror comedy with a hard R rating. The plot would have been about a male cartoonist who had sex with an animated woman he created, resulting in the birth of a daughter who was half real and half animation. This daughter would see herself as a freak of nature, and go on a rampage in the real world to seek revenge on her father. That actually sounds like a pretty cool concept, Still crazy, but interesting. But Paramount Studio wanted the film to be pushed down to a PG-13 rating, and so the script was completely overhauled without Baskey's permission. According to Baskey, he had completed a script for the film, but at the last minute was backstabbed by the producer. This drama then escalated so much, where allegedly, Baskey ended up pulling a Jeremy Clarkson and punched the producer, refusing to complete the film with Paramount having to threaten him with legal action if he didn't. Now it's important to remember that all of these are allegations from Bashki's end, but looking at how the final product turned out, yeah, I can believe there was some conflicting interest during the production. The film resulted in a financial loss, making back just over 14 million of its 28 million dollar budget. Which, yeah, I can understand. I don't really know who this film is made for. Obviously the mature content suggests an adult audience, but there's so much silly and goofy stuff going on that feels very kid-like. And the plot is so all over the place for mature audiences to follow, that I really just feel that this film is for horny teens on drugs. The animation itself is pretty good in some places, and not so good in others. Certain characters look good, such as Holly who, yeah, I would. But most of the background characters have a far simpler design, lack shading, and in some cases only have limited animation. Like, look at these background characters, they're on an animated loop. But what I will give a quick prop to is the stylistic background designs, some of which really give off that horror vibe you imagine the original script had. One thing you definitely have to admire through this film though, is the soundtrack. It just oozes that 90s vibe, and is something that you can quite easily listen to separately. All in all, Cool World, though great potential, results in being a bit of a mess. Though I would recommend checking it out for a bit of a laugh, I can't say that you'll get much more out of it. 
It would be cool to get another attempt at making a film like this in the future. I mean, Sausage Party and Deadpool have proven that there is mature audience out there for mainstream franchises. And with the future release of a Space Jam sequel in the works, maybe that could be the perfect time to give this another shot.